yes, this chapter. It there's interesting stuff in this chapter, and and some of the tools that that are discussed I'd never used before. Prof biz and prof mem I've used before, but the um, um, the shiny benchmarking thing that, that that's mentioned I'd I'd never seen before. Um, shiny load test. Um, and um, so yeah, I mean, it was an interesting read. Um, it would really help. It would really help me out if people asked questions during this because I'm not really sure um, quite how well this is going to go. Really, because the um, hold on, that's okay. That's cool. Um, so I should be able to. Hopefully, I'll be able to illustrate things using the um, the the tools. But I have I haven't run through any of the examples yet on, you know, live. Um, so yeah, I may have to ask for um, lots of help from the additional eyes in the room to get some of these things running. Um, okay, so performance right i'll just open um mastering shiny on a different window um yeah so i don't know what you uh want to do next week i i was always planning i to be honest i was kind of hoping that i might be able to twist someone's arm to come and do another interview type session but um yeah uh I, I haven't been able to do that um so i was wondering whether we might look through at the different examples that are presented throughout the book do a kind of pull some things that had been done in multiple chapters together um or, or do some kind of summary of the whole book but i don't know whether um there'd be um much interest in that um I, I, but we've got an extra week booked in in case anyone wants to you know show off some shiny things that they have um developed in the process of this um i don't know have you have you gone from um frederica have, have you felt that the the books kind of really improved your shiny knowledge and your R programming and things. Is there someone else in? Oh, Robert's in, right. Um, right, uh, yes, uh, somehow, but um, practicing the making um, an app is um, uh, it's very important as well. So yes, I've, I've found uh, new things that um, I didn't know it just to approaching to the um, the the team apps available, shiny apps available, um, mm. and trying to modify them. This is uh, the way I started. Yeah. Then yeah. with the the book club uh, and going through the chapters, I found more uh, little things that I didn't know. But I'm I, <laughs> I still need much uh, a bit more practice. Yeah. Yeah, is I mean I I'd, I'd done a lot of R programming in the past, but I, until you know eighteen months ago, till um, the until COVID forced me to start working from home. Um, not that I ever had COVID, but you know the the world closed down. Um, um, I hadn't even done like web development or anything like that. So I I, I started learning Django. Um, with the extra hour a day that I had available because I wasn't, you know, traveling into work and things. Um, and then started learning Shiny kind of, I don't know, nine months ago or something. But this, uh, the book club's really kind of, sim it's kind of, it's forced me to keep at it because I've got lots of books open where I get three or four chapters in 
and then start working on a different thing you know <laughs> so I've, I've tried to learn um what's the graphics library um d3 many many times and i get like two or three chapters into each book and never kind of actually finish the whole thing um but so it's been quite nice to do the the shiny book and actually like work all the way through all the chapters even though like some weeks it's been a rush and everything and um yeah i don't know it's been really good um right so i, I think we ought to talk about the performance chapter i don't think anyone else will be coming in um so there's a a, a nice um metaphor at the start of um the the book chapter where he compares a shiny to a, a shiny app to um a restaurant or a chain of restaurants i guess it it t turns into eventually um where um the server on which your code runs is the restaurant. A um, user of your app would be a customer. A request, which is um, the, uh, you know, for a given user, the, the things that they kind of click while working with your Shiny app. Um, is kind of equivalent to an order. And the R process that is running uh, on the server that, that, that handles those requests and, and things is equivalent to a, a chef, which was, was quite interesting. So the, I mean, the, the, so the purpose of this chapter is to kind of discuss how to make your, how to identify and improve uh your the, the kind of efficiency of your app and things like that so there's not really much point in um um speeding up code that's already pretty fast um so the 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 kind of important thing that that's kind of emphasized in this chapter is that the the first thing you ought to do is work out which steps within your app are actually the slow ones, the things that are holding other things up, and um, um, it's those aspects of the the app that you should try to speed up. Or, you know, similarly, if it's a memory hungry app, it, it's those um, memory swamps that should be cleaned up first um but yeah with regard to this restaurant metaphor there was a kind of um a few, a few different ways that you could make a given chef more efficient so you could identify slow steps in the the preparation or the cooking process and and kind of come up with ideas of how to make them faster be it through getting a a more efficient tool for I don't know, chopping carrots or something, or um, um, rearranging the kitchen so that the chef can move more efficiently from one from where they're preparing the food to where they're going to be cooking it or something. Um, to make the restaurant as a whole more efficient, you might hire more chefs or buy more restaurants. And this, the, there are parallels here. So you might. Um, identify slow steps within your app and kind of work out ways to speed them up. So at the moment, I'm working on an app related to um, COVID vaccination stuff. And within it, I've, <laughs> the, 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 there's some pretty slow steps within it, one of which is like two for loops and a kind of matrix update within them that, that, that kind of kind of an anti pattern in R. Um, so these kind of slow steps are, are things that you can measure and then fix. Um, similarly, to make a, a, you know, where the server is the equivalent of a restaurant, you might consider um, scaling up your um, servers, providing them with more bandwidth or more memory or more 
um, processes, or you might, I, I, I guess this is where the metaphor falls down, buy more restaurants. So, you know, buy the shop next door to expand or something like that. Anyway, let's go on. Um, so, yeah, so the, the, the thing that they emphasize the most here is the importance of measuring um, your app in its running state. So there's, there's two different types of um, measurement that they're interested in here. Benchmarking, um, well, uh, you know, as, as it's used in this chapter, it seemed, um, I'm, I'm not entirely certain that that's the correct use of the, the term generally, but um, in the chapter, the section on benchmarking is about um, measuring how your app behaves when it's exposed to multiple users or when it's um, exposed to a lot of requests at a time. Um, and there's a tool described called Shiny Load Test. Let me just check if I've got, um, I did install all of these things, but I never know whether I've installed them in the right environment and things like that. Um, so Shiny Load Test is a tool that you can open up your app within our studio and then record yourself clicking on a button and changing a parameter and things like that. And then it will make a log of your of the uh, buttons and stuff that you've pressed such that you can replay that um, um, session against the app um, in uh, an, another setting. So although when you're working with the app, you can only really do it one user at a time, there's this tool that can run from the command line um, which will take the recording of what you did while working with the app and say, um, lo um, work with your app as if 10 different individuals are doing the same type of thing. Um, and then you can kind of look at the reports that arise from that. Um, so, right, do I have an example of running this? Or does it go straight into profile? No, it goes straight into profiling. So I'll show you. Um, I'm sure I'd put an example of, of that in. Um, let's have a see. Profiling. OK, uh, we'll maybe come back to this at the end because um, I don't have an example app up and running at the moment for which I've got I've got a session that I can guarantee will work. But um, yeah, but that's the the basic kind of um, thing is that you would run your Shiny app, then record a session using Shiny Load Test, and then replay that session um, using this tool called Shiny Cannon, which is a uh, command line utility. Um, I'm fairly certain I installed. Yeah, so this is like a Java utility that can play against Shiny, um, which you can either use on your desktop or, or on a kind of testing server. Um, right. We'll move on to profiling, which is the thing I, I know a little bit more about ProfBiz than I do about Shiny Load Test, because at least I'd used it before Russ, this weekend. Yes, Robert. So Shiny Cannon, is that the one that you were just saying uh, has a Java backend? That uh -huh. will, what was the one that you that you were just doing that has um, that will also show like the Java that's going on? Because I tend to have a problem uh, that I'll like click things and it'll be like, ah, no, can't find that. So being able to actually 
have a log of what you clicked, that would be useful. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, that was it. There was something similar, a, a similar tool, um, the uh, shiny test used to um, log your interaction with the app as well. Um, yeah. So the, the the first tool was called um, shiny load test, and hold on, I'll open up and bring it over. So, um, so yeah, in the uh, the the documentation it it says so what it what it will do is it will record a, a typical user session and then using shiny canon you can replay that session against the um, url that your shiny app is currently deployed at um, and then subsequently you can analyze the results from that um, it's quite nice actually the the output um so there's a kind of initial so each of these rows in the output here um is a, a separate is equivalent to like a separate user using your app and there's a kind of lag at startup there's a little bit of kind of you know setting up the um CSS and HTML for the, the thing. And then um, lots of, the, you know, lots of calculation steps or kind of, hold on, was it? Uh, I think there's a better example. So um, if I, that may not be visible actually, um, but this is the same kind of thing. So your, um, you've got a session running here and you can see the steps where a function is called from your server function in blue where it's you know calculating some value or something like that um, and you can see how long it takes to start up and, and things um, so yeah it's it's quite an interesting tool but yeah i've i've yet to use it at work at least uh yeah but, um, anyway yeah so that's that's that um I'll, I'll try and run it against um one of against the app that i was talking about when i did the testing chapter in you know 20 minutes or whatever um so the profiling stuff so this is Oh, God. Um, so ProfViz is a more general R utility. Um, and what it does is um, it, it gives you a kind of graphical output of where time is being spent when a function's called. So, so there's this example in Mastering Shiny where you have a function f that calls g, which is a function that calls h. And then once f has called g, it then calls h. So each of these functions um, pauses computation for a fraction of a second. Um, so what we're going to do, I'll just try and run, oh, hold on, I'll define the functions first. Okay, so f does this, and it returns with the value 10. But while it's doing that, um, calls g and then h and while it's calling g that calls h um, if we do prof viz on the call to f what you get is this graph showing up here um, so this is time progressing 
So you've got it going from zero to a thousand milliseconds to 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 a second here. Um, initially, you call F, which calls pause, and when that pause finishes after two hundred milliseconds, G is called, which calls eight. Uh, sorry, G is called, and G pauses for a hundred milliseconds. Then it calls H, and H immediately calls pause for 300 milliseconds. When that's completed, <clears throat> you, ooh, hold on, H calls pause. Da, da, da. So yeah, you, so that's you H lost within G. Things? Sorry? Whenever I run Profviz, I always feel like I just get lost. And eventually, like, I, I sort of find my way back out. But just looking at it, it just feels like it's extremely intimidating. There, oh, there are yeah, plenty yeah, of things yeah. in R that, that like, make some sense. But, but a prof viz uh, plot, I, I actually find that the data tab is, is easier to understand. Oh, yeah, because yeah, at yeah, least yeah. you can, like, click down and sort of see where your time is going. Yeah. Yeah, um, I don't know whether, does it work if you, oh yeah, no, it works. I thought it only worked when it had the source code available, but yeah. Um, so in the data tab, there's an alternative view where this is the amount of time um, endured while F was running. This 400 milliseconds is the amount of time while G was running, and this is the amount of time while H was running. And to be honest, um, I find this tab more useful in work at the moment because it's typically memory that is the problem I have rather than speed in shiny apps because we're pulling in quite big data sets and merging them and whatnot. Um, and, and it's problems with memory that are forcing us to have to deploy on larger shiny apps instances than we probably really need um so that's quite an it's quite a nice view but yeah the flame graph thing you can run a shiny app and just have it running within profis and then after it's run for you know 30 seconds or something stop the app and then have a look at it and unless you see these big long horizontal bars where it's stuck in a single function for a long time a lot of the times you'll just see spikes and kind of sporadic stuff and it won't be so easy to work out where the time's being spent particularly if i, I find if if a function's called many many times you'll see a spike all over the place but you won't see these long horizontal things so um the the data tabs kind of nice in that it sums up the lengths of time that g was called and whatnot so yeah it's quite nice uh, but yeah no i agree with you that the 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 uh, flame graph probably isn't the most intuitive way to view this type of data um anyway this is a um, an app that um, is in the book as a kind of illustrative thing for, you know, showing how to use Profviz with a Shiny app. Um, so we've got that code there. And we can do Profviz run app app. Um, there was a note in the book, though, that said a lot, a lot of the things where you're calling out to other services, where you might be calling out to a SFTP server to download some data, or where you might be calling a um, system level function, you know, a, a grep or a wget or something like that. Um, a lot of those, a lot of the things that R can't see won't be included in the the timing of um, that 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 Profviz does. Um, 
So if downloads or uploads or whatever are, are the actual bottleneck for your app, you may get a kind of misguided sense as to what the actual um, issues are that are holding up your app from, from profit. Oop, could not find function app. It's definitely there. Ah, right, I see. Uh, hold on, I'll stop that. There, right, so. Um, Right, so what we've done there, let's have a see. Can I get the book back up? Um, so that was running um, the same set of functions. Um, oh, this probably isn't a very good way to view it, really. Um, if we try catch where would it be in here I'm trying to find where the actual f's and g's and everything were called oh there f g and h right um so Sorry about this. Right, so if we go back to performance, profiling. So this whole app was wrapped up in a um, server function that just call, sorry, what am I talking about? These functions were wrapped up in an app that just called F. Um, and every time you click an action button, F is triggered to run. Um, and yeah, um, so if we look at the flame graph for that, you can see that there's a lot of time being spent in H. I can't actually see any entry points from F. Anyway, hopefully, <laughs> I think it's a it's probably a bit. There you more go, Russ. You you just you just highlighted my problem. I I'm like, okay, sure. All these things are taking time. How did I get here in the first place? And I'm like, and I can't figure that out to save my life. Yeah, yeah. I think with this though, I I find it very hard to believe that um, you wouldn't have a good idea as to which thing is slow before running um, ProfViz because you know if you're oh if you don't you're then I think we have other app, problems. You know that if you press one button it's it, it triggers a slow process or if you um, uh, change certain parameters it's slower than when if you change others or something like that so so it isn't always it isn't always all that valuable to have this kind of thing but it may be if you can isolate what you already think to be a slow process and test that as a module or something using profis although i don't know quite how to do that um but yeah no i agree with you it is kind of confusing and also you get all this kind of event handler wrapping around everything which makes it somewhat harder to um to understand really um, it almost seems like profviz is more useful when you are testing like on one small function but when you start like calling something that calls multiple other functions and does multiple other things yeah it gets really difficult to figure out where it is that it that it breaks down. The yeah. thing that I always wish that it, I could do is basically put a browser function in the middle of a um, in the middle of a function 
stop the function and then run a prof viz like uh, on like the one little section that uh, that seems like it's causing problems. Mm. But uh, but I've never quite gotten that to work because prof viz is one of those things that I'm like, oh, this seems like it would be it would it would be so helpful. Yeah. Um, and most of the time, it just ends up feeling like I <laughs> look at it and and I'm just like I don't know what what this is, and then I just give up. <laughs> Which, you know, isn't exactly yeah, I, I suppose so. I, I have found it. I have found it really useful with a couple of apps recently. But um, yeah, it, it, I, but for those, there were. Um, you know, there were like 20 second steps and things that were quite obvious within the profiling um, visuals and, and whatnot. So um, I, th I'd, I'd, I think I'd struggle to pinpoint issues using ProfViz if, it, if you were comparing a five second step with a bunch of 500 millisecond steps. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, so what's the next? Bit? Uh, yes. So that's profiling. Um, but the so you've the, there's two different ways of measuring. There's the um, the 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 shiny load test for measuring um, how your app behaves when multiple users are using it, and there's this uh, profiling is tool for um, working out where the app spends its time while it's running. Um, they may there may be improvements to both tools as the as time goes on, but the purpose of those tools is just to find parts of your app that need a bit more work. That make it harder to use or that make it frustrating to use. Um, so, um, so yeah. So the, there's a few different optimizations that that are highlighted within this chapter. Um, one of which is to cache um, the the values that are generated by a reactive. So within your server function, if there is some function that holds up the rest of your app, but what it computes is relatively, uh, you know, it wouldn't be difficult to store, you know, it's not going to be producing a gigabyte of data or anything. Um, if there's some function that holds up your app, but is it, you know, it would be easy to store its values, you can cache those values such that when another session is started, if someone wants to um, view the values that had been, yeah, so basically your pre, when one user's using it, you're computing the values for, for use during that user's session and st saving those values so that they're like pre-computed for when anyone else wants to use them. So if you've got, um, I don't know, stocks and shares or something from last week and someone wants to view that data on Monday and then someone else wants to view that data on Monday, the, the, the data that's um presented will probably be the same but if you want to view the data on the tuesday you might need to update the 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 values that are presented um anyway um and you can do the same thing for um the rendering functions as well as the kind of reactive functions uh, and also um there is there was some code in the book regarding how you can do this for graphical output as well. Um, and uh, presumably, you know, in case 
generating the graphs that you're interested in is taking a long time. But uh, to be honest, I've never been in a position where generating the graphs takes considerably longer than generating the data for those graphs. But, um, but yeah, so there's lots of ways of using caching within your app. Um, there are other optimizations that are described in the book. So for example, um, um, and, and there were links to a few talks as well. Um, so for example, doing as little as possible um, is a optimization as well, which I quite liked. So this is like, um, this is kind of uh, profiling, kind of trying to ensure that when you update a value, say, if, if you set a parameter in the app, um, and there are tables or graphs or, or whatever that are updated as a result of changing that parameter, you want to make sure that only those graphs that are influenced by that parameter are um, updated. And for those that are dependent on that parameter, that they're only updated once. So this is, again, kind of coming back to um, uh, getting a good handle on the reactive graph that underlies your app as a means to kind of improve its efficiency. There, there were a few um, functions described in the reactive graph section, um, event reactive and things like that, that behaved in an eager way, which possibly may be a, a, a I'm trying to think of a good example that might lead to things being computed when they don't need to be computed, uh, but I can't, I'm coming up dry, to be honest. Other, other uh, optimizations are to simply not have your shiny app do a computation. So for example, you could set up a, a, a weekly preparation script type thing that prepares the data that's then ingested by Shiny rather than have that data processed within your Shiny app um, each time a, a user wants to view it. Um, similarly, uh, doing this kind of data preparation type work outside of the server function was described as an optimization, which came as a bit of a surprise to me, but it probably just illustrates how little I really know about the kind of architecture of a Shiny app. Um, so when I've deployed apps in the past, it's always been on shinyapps.io. And in my experience, um, it's, it's very rare to have more than one user at any one time using one of the tiny apps that I've ever made. Um, so I was quite surprised by this, but um, when your app starts up, the code in your kind of global dot R um, oh, is run, and then when when any new user joins, it, you know, starts a session, the server function is then ran for that user. If another user um, wants to use your app, then the server function is run, but the kind of setup, the global uh, code isn't ran again for that second user, provided the app hasn't kind of gone to sleep in the time. Uh, which came as a bit of a surprise because I, I kind of just expected that the whole thing rest, you know, started from cold for each new user. But, um, so that's quite interesting to, to me, but may just be a um, sign of my web ignorance. But um, other optimizations like importing methods and um, only doing 
you know, if there are slow steps, you know, um, so if it takes 30 seconds to prepare all the files for downloading, if the user wants to download those files, don't prepare those files if they don't want to download them. Um, and this was a statement about learning asynchronous programming um, w as a, a, a potential optimization. So um, when your shiny apps are running, there's typically quite a bit of downtime because it's waiting to respond to events from the user. Um, and if there are um, steps that can be done in a kind of asynchronous way, that you can use that downtime to 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 have those steps running in the background. Um, yeah, um, there's probably many other optimizations, uh, but um, yeah. So what's next? Oh yes, and there's lots of resources, tons of talks. So I, I haven't seen any of these talks yet, um, um, but yeah, no, the, I don't know. I mean, it looks, it, it does look very interesting. Certainly the, 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 the improvements to the caching in, in shiny apps look, look very interesting. Um, are we having a session on shiny server? I don't, uh, uh, well, I, I have no other sessions really planned out in full yet for the book club. Um, we have another session next week uh, kind of booked in and I was kind of hoping it, it would be like a, you know, people might show their own apps off and, and whatnot. Um, but yeah, I hadn't booked anything in. Um, anyway, so that's the chapter. Now there was, can I go back to um, the benchmarking thing and I'll find an app somewhere um, that I can run. So if I take this out into the browser and I uh, open project, um, what was the one? ER injuries. Oh no. That one. Okay, so what was that? Um, the oh, foolish. Right. Um, let's go to the actual book. Um, so. Um, 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 um. So to record a session, um, I'll just show this is the, the, the app that I, oh God. Right. A few weeks ago, I did a talk about testing, which was a bit more prepared than this one. Um, and um, this, app is from chapter four or chapter five of the book and I kind of went through the process of um, refactoring the app such that it was easier to test and things. Um, now if we stop that and the trouble is it's only really got one button if we use so run app myapp.r and then okay so hold on but how do i so how would i do that and be able to also do i need to have two r studios open at the same time maybe i'll hold on i'll just um Is it going to tell me? Okay. Mm. 
then I can use <laughs> use shiny load test. What? Sorry, I'm frequently confused by copying between different things because my terminal requires that you copy it, you paste in a different way to. Um, so what was the terminal? 4418. Okay, so. So I am recording a session. Okay, and then to stop the session, once you're done, close the app. Okay. Okay, so what happened there? Recording.log has been produced. Um, and what does it look like? So. Okay. Right. So uh, I don't think you're expected to look at the logs like that. But um, if we try to then replay that using the log that we just generated. So if I start another terminal and we take K shiny can so it was but it was four one eight four four one eight then Take the rest of that code. Oh, come on. Right, we'll try that again. Oh, sorry, sorry. I don't know quite what's going on here. There's obviously some issue with copying and pasting into the terminal in our studio. Hold on, I'll pull in a actual proper terminal. Um, right. Um, four, four, one. Just a sec, that won't work because it's the wrong wrong port, but that should work. Run one already exists and well, this is kind of real time using <laughs> using a new tool <laughs> straight out of the uh, okay, so recording dot log. HTTP four four one eight was that one still running? Yeah, that one's still running. Oh dear. Sorry, I don't think I'll be able to bring this to light. Output down run one already exists. Oh, maybe if I Last event in the log was not open. He says, did you close the tab after recording? Um, right, okay, so it's not, so um, I pro pro 
Possibly not. I just, uh, while I was recording it, um, so I had bah, 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 that running, and then I just clicked the stop button at the uh, in the viewer. Um, right, okay. Well, anyway, I think I'll leave that <laughs> for now. Um, but uh, yeah, um, it's a bit of a shame. I was quite looking forward to running that. I just haven't had time to 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 play with this tool yet this week. Um, uh, yeah, presumably there's a specific way that you have to shut down your app afterwards or shut down your session afterwards. But anyway, the, um, but this this the this terminal is is a, is a R Studio terminal. Or the one computer. that I just ran it from, um, this one is yeah. uh, that's just a um, yep. bash uh, command line that I started using. Um, but terminal. maybe he doesn't find the, uh, the file. Yeah, as, I guess it's possible. I did move into the right directory, but because um, this is um, well, d d d if I the recording dot log is present and if i um open 4418 if i open that a second time it's still running um yeah yeah that's weird um yeah sorry uh i was kind of Kind of thought I thought that might work a bit more straightforward than it did, but that I guess that's what happens when you just use a tool in your brain while you're reading something <laughs> rather than that in actual in actual fact. I'll I'll try and work out how to get this running. But um yeah, so so this chapter, there were a couple of tools presented, ProfBiz and um Shiny Load Test and Shiny Canon. Um, there were a, a kind of big emphasis on working out whether there is part of your app that needs to be optimized before just going in and optimizing things. Um, uh, there were a couple of uh, ways of optimizing your, your Shiny apps, be that through caching, offloading the processing into a different, um, act, either outside of your server function or into uh, pre-computed or asynchronously computed um, things. And there, um, 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 yeah, I don't know. I mean, it was, it was quite an interesting chapter, but I did think as an ending to the book, it seemed a bit strange to me. It, w it would have been quite nice for there to be a um, case study chapter again or something like that, where um, similarly to how... Um, so this case study is the thing that I rebuilt for the testing chapter, but it doesn't really lend itself to, um, I don't know, I mean, I guess it was possible to modularize it, it was possible to turn it into a package. There weren't really any security issues related to it, and there wasn't really many performance issues related to it. So it would have been nice if there'd been a kind of case study chapter at the end where aspects of the reactive graph and aspects of the um, kind of practicalities of Shiny were emphasized again. Um, but yeah, um, anyway, but I thought it was quite an interesting chapter. It's just, I, I, I just rushed it through because no one offered to kind of talk on it. Um, but anyway, thanks for coming along this week. Um, I, I will organize something for next week. I'll try and make sure that, that, that the group gets together um because yeah i mean this has been like four, four months three or four months or something of um of meetings 
Um, and yeah, I think it's been really useful. I am planning um, to do the uh, engineering production grade shiny apps book um, as a book club, probably starting at the end of August or at the start of September. Um, the 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 time zone may be a bit of a uh, maybe a bit weird um, relative to this one that was always at this time on a Tuesday um, because it just it just struck me that that particular book required quite a bit of shiny knowledge and quite a bit of software engineering knowledge so it might be a bit too niche for the R for data science um, kind of introductory um book clubs and i was keen to get as many people as possible to attend it um so i figured that the best way to do that would be to have um one week in one time zone and one week in another and we'd have a kind of european african friendly time zone one week here and a kind of west coast or central america friendly time zone for the other week um just as a way to kind of get through a book that i quite wanted to to learn it is quite an interesting book though because like it i mean a lot of the challenges that i um i i've hit up against don't seem to be covered in it <laughs> so i'm wondering whether i'm just not making engineering grade shiny apps and like the problems of working with databases and kind of um data hosting sites and things like that are, are trivial enough <laughs> to an engineer <laughs> but, but they've been the main kind of source of my problems um and also i don't think there was anything on like security or anything in that in that engineering grade book but um uh anyway We'll uh, we'll discuss that uh, in in a future book club. But I will I will book the session for next week, and it would be nice if you know a, a few people turn up and and we get, you know, even if it's just a kind of this is an app that I created early on while working through Master in China, and here's uh, something I've created more recently. I think it'd be quite nice. Um, anyway, right. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, I'm going to have to head off because I've got a toddler going crazy in the house. Um, right. Thank you. See, Thank you. No problem. See you both next week. Bye. Bye. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>